Welcome back to Monday Musings, a casual conversation about culture and theology. I'm Justin Ely. And I'm Daniel Chen. We're just a couple guys talking about some stuff. The stuff we're going to talk about today is the Asbury Revival. Uh, so we are recording this uh, a few days before it will be released. So at the time of recording, this thing is still going on. Um, but for over 100 hours um, at Asbury University and Asbury Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky, um, there's been constant prayer, praise, Bible reading, Bible proclamation. Um, hundreds of people are traveling in to experiencing it, to experience it. Uh, uh, reports are saying people are repenting of sin, uh, trusting in Christ, um, and all, all sorts of stuff. Um, so we're going to talk about that on the podcast today. But before we do, we have our listener of the month. And our listener of the month is a special one uh, today. Th- this is, I'm just going to build this person up before we, we give the name. This person apparently lives in a different state. We'll start there. The great state of Alabama. Uh, regularly shares this podcast with many people. Apparently, we're going pretty pretty uh, viral in the Alabama area. Nice. Thank you so much, by the way. Uh, shares shares the has discussions has has like group discussions about this podcast, and maybe the person knows uh, who she is by now. We're talking, of course, about Lisa Plemons. Lisa Plemons, listener of the month, who is Amelia Mafood's mother. And Amelia is a member of our church. So Lisa, thank you for listening uh, so faithfully. Uh, Thank you for your encouragement last month. Um, And thank you for um, raising Amelia, I guess. That's a thanks. Yeah, of course. uh, Yeah, for just being a great listener sharing the podcast. You know, I'm like, should we have a listener of the year? She sounds like she could qualify for that if we had that, you know? I I think it's, it's quite possible, I think. So... So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for being a great listener of the month and apparently listener of the year nominee. Uh, might <laughs> yes. be a thing now. Maybe, yeah, we we... Do, maybe every December we should do listener of the year, resource of the year, restaurant of the year. And then life hack, life of, hack the year. of the year. Okay. Yeah. I like that. I don't know. This could be a good way to end it. You could take all your listeners of the month put them in a pot and just pull one out. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, for sure. For sure. But yeah, thank you to all our, our listeners. And if this podcast has been helpful for you, uh, we'd love for you to give it a like and a share, share with one of your friends. We'd love to just help get this word out and help people live their lives out in a gospel centered way. So we're hoping that this, this helps you do that. For sure. For sure. So let's talk about revival. Uh, and, and no, uh, revival is not necessarily the, uh, the thing that you go to on church or in a tent outside of your church. Um, we'll talk more about what, what revival is, uh, later and if it's correct to call this, um, a revival, but that's, that's what many people have been saying. So a couple, uh, Wednesdays ago, I guess it would have been. Maybe a week ago, right? A week ago today. Yeah, so like February 8th, I think. um, Asbury had their chapel from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. And from all accounts, it was a regular chapel. Students came, students went. Uh, But about 30 students kind of lingered after. And the worship team just kept playing worship. And then there were people just started like confessing sin and praying together and people would describe just kind of a, a sweet spirit in the room, you know, and, um, students started to come back and it, it kept growing. And, and then you turn around and for 24 hours, they had been praying and worshiping and more students were coming in and, um, day after day that just kept happening. And, People kept saying people are like repenting of sin and praying together. And um, some accounts I heard people come into faith. um, And then other universities started like bussing in students. Um, And then all of a sudden 
they were filled in their main chapel. And so they opened up overflow seating in another chapel that seats like 500 main chapel seats, like a thousand, this seats like 500. And then that got full. And then they opened up another overflow room of 500 and that got full. And so it's like standing room only in all these three locations, uh, totally student led, not planned at all. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that that's kind of what's been going on. Um, you kind of had have three reactions. One was like, "Oh, I didn't know about that." Uh, two is like super, um, you know, rejoicing. Yes, the awesome. Uh, and then third is kind of skeptical. Like, well, let me, you know, I don't know about that. Um, yeah. So, when did you find out about it, and what were your original thoughts? Yeah, so my I found out about it. I guess it was like Wednesday evening or Thursday morning. Maybe I read an article about it. Um, and my first thought—I mean, I had a lot of initial thoughts, I guess. Uh, but my first thought was like, "What are the logistics of this? Like, <laughs> everyone stayed there overnight. Two people stayed there overnight. How do they right. eat? Uh, <laughs> what about bathrooms? Like, if it's standing room only, like." Who's monitoring that? You know, maybe I'm just a logistics person. I'm just like, <laughs> maybe I, you are. Someone, exp someone explain to me the logistics of this thing. And my second reaction is one of, was one of like skepticism. I think, um, mm -hmm. not that I didn't hope that it was real. I think it came, comes from you know we did a podcast not too long ago about what's happening in the UMC. Sure. Um, and Asbury is the umc's college seminary i mean is no it's just associated not at all no it's it's wesleyan in theology but it's not connected to the denomination ah gotcha okay so that's actually helpful information for me because i was like i was like if it's like the umc's flagship not at all yeah they've they've been very connected to the global methodist church the new conservative denomination getting started you know, that actually makes me much less skeptical. I mean, I already <laughs> right. was not skeptical when we started right. this podcast, but you yeah. know, you see what I'm saying though. Like yeah. it was like, wait, what's happening? Like I thought it, it seemed like a, maybe an odd place for the spirit to move in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in my mind is the key phrase here is like, sure. I was like, that didn't make a lot of sense to me. Actually, now that it's like, I know that it's like the conservative arm that does make more sense to me. Um, yeah. But I think it was just kind of like, well, are people really coming to faith? Are people, is this really real? And then I think my third emotion, I know yes for one, but my third <laughs> thought was, I'm like, why doesn't this ever happen to me? Like, why can't I ever be part of one of these? Or like, why doesn't it happen in the, in our like reformed circles? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's my question. Uh, yeah. And it's, you know, I don't know if we're going to answer that third question, but it, it's a worthwhile question to ask ourselves. Like if you're listening to this and you're part of a reform formed circle, right? Mm -hmm. uh, why, why is that the case? I don't know. It, it's an interesting thought experiment at the very least. But what were your thoughts? Yeah. So I guess some background for me. Yeah. If you don't know, I grew up United Methodist and uh, in a, in a Bible believing uh, United Methodist Church and um, had a few people in the congregation that had uh, <clears throat> gone to Asbury and my pastor growing up until I was about um, eight uh, or until I was about 13 was uh, um, an Asbury grad. And so I, I grew up with a high regard for Asbury. And uh, there was a revival, a similar kind of revival in 1970 that uh, I heard a lot about. When I was 13 years old, um, I felt called to ministry and sat down and met, met with my pastor. So sorry, I guess my grown up pastor probably would have been until I was about 10 or so. When I was 13, met, met with my pastor and um, said, I think I might feel called into full-time vocational ministry. Uh, and you know, you know me, I'm already thinking about what school do I need to go to? I need to, right. you know, I'm in eighth grade. I need to go ahead and decide my grad school plans. Um, and, uh, Asbury was one of the two that he recommended, uh, to me. And, um, as I was growing up in the UMC, I started to, I began to notice the, the liberal drift going on. 
And um, most of the United Methodist pastors in Atlanta um, come from Emory, Candler School of Theology. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. And uh, 90% of them, not 90%, uh, well, 90% of those who come out of Emory are are horrifically theologically liberal. Um, about 10% come out and... <laughs> it pushed them far in the other direction. So some people come out super conservative from Emory because they're like, that was a, a load of just garbage. Um, and they push back the other direction. And I, I knew some people that that, that happened to. From, from what I've heard, some professors at Emory, like aren't even Christians, right? Oh, <laughs> like, oh it, it's bad. It's like next level bad. Yeah. It, it's, it's like heresy on a regular basis. Bad, like very, but mm. yeah, they're, I would imagine most of the professors are not Christians at, at uh, born again wow. Christians. Yeah. Yeah. But Asbury was a totally different story. And so, um, when I graduated, um, university of Georgia with my bachelor's, I enrolled at Asbury. And, uh, before I kind of transitioned more into like a reform Baptistic direction, um, I was a stu a proud student at Asbury. And so I, I took, uh, probably seven classes there. I've, I've been in the buildings where this is happening, you know? And so, uh, and, and I still have a very high regard for that school. Um, it is, it is a great, great school. And, uh, was also a part of, a pretty charismatic, uh, campus ministry when I was in college, the Wesley foundation. Um, and, uh, and they talked about revival all the time. I would say probably too much, you know, <laughs> uh, but so it, I, when I heard it, I just thought, praise God, uh, this is wonderful. And I hope it spreads and I hope our church, uh, gets lit on fire, uh, a fire that started at Asbury. So I, I was originally, um, thrilled with it. And I, re I remain thrilled with it and pray that, um, I pray it spreads to every college in this country. And I, I pray that God would wake us up out of our slumber and, um, that he would use this as a spark that lights the fire and, um, changes the direction of a declining Christian population. And, uh, one of the things I'm like, I, I've been encouraged by as, as I've, I've read it is, you know, it can just be hard to do ministry in a post-Christian era, you know, and, and you look at the statistics and you see the decline of the church and, and you're like, well, I guess being faithful in our age just means like being faithful in a declining Christianity and just kind of doing hard work and seeing little fruit, but at least you're faithful. You know, that, right. that's kind of like in some ways what, you almost have like, well, this is just kind of my lot in life. Right. Uh, but this is like a reminder to me of not necessarily um, the spirit blows where he wishes and God could turn the fate of our country in a totally different direction overnight if he chose to. And so it was just, it was good for my soul to be reminded of um, the powerful work of God that he can pour out whenever he chooses to. Um. So that, that was my initial reaction. Um, but not everyone had a positive reaction. So some people have had kind of negative reactions to this. How would you define or describe those negative reactions? Yeah, I think a lot of, most of the negative reactions I've seen have come from one particular Facebook group that I'm part of. <laughs> filled with people who are always skeptical of everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I think most of what I have seen is they're not like putting it down actively. They're more just like, this is prob these are, these are probably the reasons why this isn't a, like real, like not a real revival, not, this is why like, these are the reasons like, you know, I don't think I've seen anyone say like, this is stupid or this is satanic or this is, you know, but it's just kind of like, uh, this is, these are the reasons probably why 
it's like the Holy Spirit's really not moving, I guess. Yeah, I feel like it's like those who uh, kind of view themselves as like the gatekeepers to right doctrine. Um, those are the people that have been like, well, you know, I need to basically kind of like, I need to go up there to check it for myself to see if I can approve of this thing. Yeah. Um, Is that like, do you have to like apply to be a gatekeeper or yeah, I think you got to have some extra schooling for it. And, you know, so. I feel like, you know, I don't, I don't want to knock it too much because holding to the truth is a really good thing. Sure. But sometimes it feels like the kid that's like reminds the teacher at the end that, Hey, you forgot to give us homework, you know? Yeah. You're that guy. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I guess it's, um, it's bothered me. Uh, just because I'm like, man, I, I, we can debate about like, if it's a revival and, and we'll actually talk about that in a second. Like, that's fair. That's a fair, like thing, but it, it's also like, and it's like, well, I, I don't know if there are people coming to faith. And so then it's not a revival. And I'm like, okay, at the bare minimum, at the bare minimum, we have hundreds of people that, uh, have been offering praises to the Lord nonstop for like a week almost now. Yeah. If that's all that it is, I can celebrate that. Yeah. Why can't we <laughs> celebrate that? You know? Um, and I am kind of, you know, you asked the question, why doesn't this happen in our circles? Um, I do wonder sometimes for the, uh, more theologically inclined. Um, I would we know what to do if the Lord sent a revival? Um, or or would we be so busy trying to control it and control God that? Um, I don't know. That that's been something I've thought about a lot. Of, uh, yeah you know, critical spirits and people that just kind of sit in, in the place of, of judgment so much. I just feel like there's, there's just so much judgment that happens in the Christian world, specifically like Christian Twitter that I'm just right. exhausted by it. Um, right. And I, I'm just kind of exhausted by the divisions and um, call it whatever you want to. I'm just grateful God's doing a work there. And I pray that um, it would stay biblical and stay, um, centered on Jesus, not show. Right. Um, and that it would spread. I, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think on one side, like you can go way too far on the like Holy Spirit side of things. I don't know if that's like the right way to describe it, where sure. you're just like, you know, you, I don't know if you've seen the videos, but there's videos out there of people like, smacking people on the forehead and they're like crumpling to the ground and stuff. And you're like, obviously you're just like making stuff up. You know what I mean? Not, not at the that's Asbury bad. revival. No, 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 Yeah. Just other places. Just no, like, yeah, but it's easy to lump everything in yes. to that category. Right. Yeah. But I feel, feel like on our side, you know, to critique our conservative theological side, sometimes it can feel like, People act as if the Trinity is like God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the doctrine, you know? Yeah, the Father, the Son, the Holy Bible. In the, yeah, right. Yeah. And, you know, we, we're we not going to ever lower the importance of the Bible on this podcast. The Bible is going to be held high, high, high. But, you know, I do feel like having spent so many years in the conservative theological you know, circles we're in, it does feel like the Holy Spirit is the member of the Trinity we talk about least and forget about most. Yeah. I, I think that's spot on. Um, I, I would love to read, Timothy Tennant is the president of Asbury, and he wrote a blog post on this on uh, February 14th. Um, I'd love to read just part of it because I think he just summarizes what's going on so well. Dr. Tennant writes, uh, something special happened last Wednesday in the chapel of Asbury University Chapel. The Lord began to move in the lives of a group of students. These embers have now been fanned into flame, and there is clearly a definite move of God in our midst. 
We should not spend too much time looking for human causality, though there have been many praying earnestly for years for this. It is first, last, and foremost a tribute to the grace of God to reveal himself and to call a new generation to faithfulness at a time when we most needed it. There comes a point when the people of God become tired of casual prayers uh, and move to the point of desperation, which opens us up in fresh ways to God's surprising work. That is what I've experienced most over the past week in my own life. I've been reticent to write blogs or to make a lot of public statements about this outpouring at Asbury, because it is always better to stand in awe of something than to talk about something. I have been in Hughes Auditorium or Estes or both every day and night, and it is like stepping into a flowing spiritual river. You sense the presence and power of God working in people's lives. Since last Wednesday, when the outpouring began, I have reflected many times on Jesus' statement about the Spirit when he said, the wind blows wherever it wants. Just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. This is not a time to manage this or try to shape it. This is simply a time to receive from God's hand. Then he talks a little bit about the revival of uh, 1970. Um, and then he says this, Despite the endless coverage on social media and the regular media, which is calling this a revival, I think it is wise to see this at the current phase as an awakening. Only when we see lasting transformation, which shakes the comfortable foundations of the church and truly brings us uh, all to a new and deeper place, can we look back and in hindsight say, yes, this has been a revival. An awakening is where God begins to stir and awaken people from their spiritual slumber. This is definitely happening, happening not only in Wilmore, but as the move of God spreads to other schools and communities across the nation and even the world. There are many reports that this is what is happening. But we must keep our hearts and eyes fixed on Jesus and ask him to complete the work that he has begun so that over time there is a lasting transformation in the lives of those being touched by God. Um, I love that. I yeah. just think he he summarized it uh, so well. Um. So yeah, I think Asbury Awakening is certainly correct to say. Yeah, maybe may revival. Um, which I think I'd like to kind of transition into this. Like, what is a revival? Yeah. Um, and I just want to say too, just kind of because I started with saying that I wasn't like, I was critical of it. Yeah, I think where I I, I would stand now is, and you mentioned this a little bit, but what. Like best case scenario, people come to faith. Uh, because even if you say no one's coming to faith, I'm like, you think every single student on the campus of Asbury is a believer? No sure. way. Born again. No, like yeah. there's plenty of people that attend churches that really aren't mm -hmm. believers, mm -hmm. right? Um, quote unquote cultural Christians. There's still a ton of those out there, right? Right. What if they're coming to faith, right? Yeah. But so I'm like, best case scenario, people are coming to faith missionaries are sent out and a movement starts from Asbury to all over the country and all over the world. Best case yep. scenario. Yep. Worst case scenario, a bunch of college students got a bunch of other college students and adults to come in and sing praises to God and pray for like seven days or, you know, however long this lasts. Yep. And some of them jumped up and down. Some of them prayed for healing that if you're a cessationalist, you don't agree with. <laughs> Uh, some people maybe are talking in tongues. I don't know. I've, I've not been there. I have no idea. I'm assuming some of this stuff is probably happening. And it, you, but worst case, some people sang songs to in praise and worship to God. They're so excited. They're jumping up and down. And then no one talks about this in six months. That's the worst mm -hmm. case scenario. Mm -hmm. But why can't we pray that this is going to be a movement that changes the lives of millions of non-believers yeah. as well. Like, yeah. I just don't, I guess like I had to, like, even in my own heart, I'm just like, it's not like really crazy stuff is happening there. Right. Like the videos I've seen, just, it's just sound, it looks like a worship service that has more energy to it. That's like what the videos look like to me. Right. 
like i don't see any like holding of snakes or you know like stuff that's like oh no no like no, concerning no. right no. and so i'm like i just don't really get what the critique is like why can't we just be excited and pray that god uses this mm -hmm. so yeah. even if it's even if it's not a true revival why can't we pray that it becomes one yeah like why can't we have a positive outlook and like say praise god that people are praising god yeah at the very least, people are worshiping. Is that yeah. is that not something to celebrate? You know, right. I think that's kind of where I land with it right now. Yeah. At another point in his article, Tim Tennant said, another point regularly observed by those who have been a regular part of these services is the solemnity and peace in the various places where this movement has spread around town. Sometimes we envision, quote, revivals as times when we hear fiery sermons and there are big outbursts of emotion. This move of God is marked more by quiet weeping than a mode of shouting. Mm. And I've heard that several from several eyewitness accounts of uh, some of the videos are excited worship, but uh, apparently a lot of it has been very peaceful, tranquil, quiet, confession of sin, crying, um, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, but it brings to the question, like, what is a revival? Yeah. So, of course, Tim Keller, uh, of course, I quote him. Uh, he's got an article which we'll link to the the ten marks of revival, and he he points out there there have been uh, periods of history that we call revival, and uh, there these are periods where there's an explosion in spiritual in interest and the growth of the church. So in in Europe and North America, there were significant revivals in the 1740s, 1830s, 1850s. Uh, there was an 1857 revival that began in Lower New York City uh, that Keller quotes that. This was called the Fulton Street Revival. And by one account, during about two years, 10% of the population of Manhattan was converted and joined the city's churches. That's crazy. Uh, yeah. And then in the 20th century, he knows there have been major revivals in East Africa, Korea, and many other localized ones. So what causes revivals? Well, he says, ultimately, uh, it's the, the spirit. Um, but he said, uh, he thinks it can be these kind of 10 marks can be bundled into three categories. So he, the three instrumental means of revival, the three parts of revival and the four results of revival. Uh, so the three instrumental means of revival, uh, Keller says the Holy spirit is the ultimate, uh, cause of revival. Uh, but underneath the Holy spirit first, is a recovery of the gospel. So the default mode of the human heart is self-salvation and works righteousness, and we can do that in a variety of different ways. But revival comes from a rediscovery of the wonder of grace, of what Christ has done. Um, secondly, he says, there's corporate prayer, um, extraordinary kingdom-centered prevailing prayer across the ordinary walls that divide Christians. Um, that's also something we have, we've seen in people praying for revival and at the Asbury revival uh, is very prayer centered. And there's a lot of different streams of Christianity coming in and being a part of this. Yeah. It's interesting. And then third, he said is creativity. Uh, no revival is just like the last one. Um, so he said, for example, the Great Awakening was based on the innovation of the itinerant preaching, including open-air meetings. The 1857 revival, however, was based on lay-led prayer meetings. Um, so in each generation, some new methods arise for getting the gospel out. Uh, so those are kind of the three instrumental means, Keller says. And then the three parts of revival are really interesting. First, he said, nominal church members get converted. Um, so people like you said, right. There's probably people at Asbury that are like, yeah, I'm a Christian. Um, but not, not really. And so you would expect in a revival for those people to really realize, oh my goodness, I, I'm lost. Yeah. I need to be saved. Right. So that, that's something that happens in revival. Uh, second, and we've seen a lot of this one at Asbury sleepy Christians wake up to an immediate sense of God's love and presence. Um, that, that is something very experiential that has been, I've seen noted a lot in kind of the eyewitness accounts of 
uh, a deep awareness of God's love and presence um, at Asbury. And then third, non-believers outside the church are attracted to the Christian community in remarkable numbers. And uh, th- this is kind of where the question's still out on Asbury, you know, if it fits in kind of a revival uh, take. Right. Um, and we'll, we'll see. But, it, I mean, there are some reports of, of non-Christians getting saved. But um, so then he, he lists uh, four parts of a revival. He said, if a revival gets underway, there are usually four results or responses. First, there is always the excessive fringe of the revival. (laughs) Here we go. He said, instead of being humbled by the new sense of God in their lives, some people seem to get puffed up with pride. They become Mm. condemning of Christians, not in their own party. Leaders become elevated to positions of power before they are ready and often experience highly publicized lapses. Sometimes out-and-out charlatans see their opportunity because of the gullibility and vulnerability of the newly converted and put themselves into authority. Many doctrinal idiosyncrasies or outright heresies are countenanced because spiritual experience has become the main standard of validity, not biblical truth. That's interesting. Yeah. You wouldn't expect that as kind of a result. Yeah. Yeah. Secondly, he says, in response to the excessive fringe, there is a mainstream cultural backlash. The people in the leading cultural institutions find revivals frightening and vulgar. They usually fix their attention on the excessive and point out to the rest of the world saying, see, there is where the revival stuff leads. Um, Interesting. And that is kind of some of the the more reform-leaning people tend to go toward that, you know? Well, or at this next point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, here we are. Thirdly, some conservative traditional church leaders also attack the revival. This is partly due to the warranted concerns about the excesses, as well as the an overemphasis on experience and underemphasis on the importance of the church. It is often also due to how jealous and threatened pastors can be when other ministries in their town are growing by leaps and bounds. <laughs> Then he gets to number four. Despite all this, when a revival is broad and deep enough, there is a real impact on society. There have always been social reforms in the wake of revivals, the repeal of child labor laws, the abolition of slavery, a decrease in crime, improvements in the institution of marriage, and many other benefits. So, yeah, interesting thoughts on what a revival actually is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so whether or not what's going on at Asbury, uh, it may or may not be a revival, but the Lord is certainly doing something. And uh, for that, I'm very grateful. Yeah. You know, I just think like, I think the jealousy thing one is an interesting one that I think I've felt in my own heart a little bit. It's mm-hmm. one that we're probably least likely to admit. So I'll, sure. I'll admit it from my own heart <laughs> that it's like, I, I like, I'm like, in some ways it's like, do I want to go worship for 12 hours? It's like, not really. I like watching TV, you know, but, but some of it's like the jealousy in my own heart of like, man, I wish I, I had that desire more. Yeah. But also kind of like, you know, being in the suburbs where we are, like, it's just easy to be a sleepy Christian. It is. And it's easy for me to be a sleepy Christian. I'm a pastor. Yeah. You know, it's easy for me to see all the sleepy Christians. And I'm like, I I want us to wake up, you know? Um, So I I get that jealousy thing partially for Mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing when I read this too is like, I think the praying for revival is, it's not a bad thing. I just think in some ways it's, maybe it's just the terminology thing. I'm just, it feels a little silly. Like I'm like, whether this is a revival or not, I'm like, I want people to praise God. I want people to come to faith. I want the world to look more like the kingdom of God. Yeah. So if you want to call that a revival, sure. Yeah, but if anything heading towards that, I'm like, isn't that a good thing? I just that's what I keep thinking about. That's what I keep coming back to is like, can't we say like, God, okay, let's say worst case scenario, this starts heading off in the wrong direction. Can we say, God, would you redirect it to the right direction? Sure, but but it's not that. It seems like it's headed in the right direction from what yeah. I've seen. Yeah. I, I don't I don't think I've read any actual reports of it heading in the wrong direction at all. So why, like, you know, it'd be cool to look back in 20 years and be like, I remember that happened. And it, it, it knocked that dominoes to, to, you know, this cool thing God did in 
yeah. the U.S. slash the world from there. Yeah. I don't know. That'd be super cool. Like I, I don't know. Yeah, it it's um, <clears throat> it's actually convicted me toward praying for revival, um, because I just think about like. When I was a part of the Wesley Foundation, just the more um, charismatic campus ministry, my my like critique was, I wish you would make more of the like ordinary means of grace, <laughs> right? Just preaching the Bible, being a part of a church, and discipleship, you know, sharing discipleship, the gospel. and evangelism. Yeah. And then now seeing this, I'm like, you know. Now I'm a part, I think, of a movement that maybe doesn't make enough of revival. And like, yes to the ordinary means. Preach the Bible, uh, pray, uh, go to church, be a part of a church, evangelize, disciple people. And if, if there's never a great move of God, you've been faithful. You know, and the yeah. word, the word does the work and transforms people. If if you've been listening to this podcast, mm -hmm. you know, we are all about the ordinary means of grace. Yeah. <laughs> We're all about it. Yeah. But, um, I'm like, ha have I, have I slipped into like not believing in God for great things that frankly, I think our charismatic brothers and sisters are better at. And yeah. have I, one, one person asked me one time, like, I was a part of a seminar or something, and the question was, if God answered all the prayers you're praying right now, all of them, how different would our city be? Mm. Or would a few of your family members have fewer health problems? <laughs> right. And I was like, you know, that I think there is something to, like, begging God to, you know, rend the heavens and pour his spirit out and send send a great work in our time um to see just conversions all over the place and um, yeah and i yeah it, the whole thing has convicted me of like oh ye of little faith um yeah and it's been good for me to to reflect on all this yeah we we pray too small we do um because like you know even using the term ordinary means of grace which is ordinary and regular right Right. But why not pray that God does something extraordinary? Yep. You know? But but it has got it has got me thinking and uh and a lot of it's due to your suburban comment, you know. We're in the suburbs. One I I do think one of the reasons like historically revivals are associated with college students a lot. Um but I'm like, man, if um if the Lord struck us, you know, at our church would we miss it because we were trying to get home for nap time? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Are, are we so like compartmentalized and that we would miss God pouring his spirit out in a unique way? I, you know, it, it kind of, it's jarred me a little bit because, um, yeah, I mean, I, I did even like, like you, the logistics, I, I got thinking of like, Okay, like if that happened at our church and we're going twenty four seven, like what would that look like? And um yeah, but I, I think the sad answer is if a lot of us are being honest, we would miss it because we got the schedule we want to keep and the yeah. things we want to do. And it's just been convicting for me to think about like what does it look like to desire God's presence above everything else? Yeah. Um, so good, good reflections for me out of the, what's going on at Asbury. Yeah. And I just think let's, let's just pray, you know, let's pray yeah. that God uses this and, uh, for the people who are there and then for us here who never, who never attend a, you know, a worship session at Asbury, you know, mm -hmm. but that it can still spurn us to have these kind of thoughts to say, God, would you, would you do something here? Yeah. You know, For it sure. doesn't have to look like that. Maybe For it does sure. look like that. It doesn't have to look like that. You know, yeah. I'd love to see people come to faith and worship God. <laughs> yeah. You Amen. Know? Amen. Well, thanks for joining us um, as we discuss the 
Asbury Revival or Awakening, depending on your perspective there. Uh, next week, we're going to try to just do a really bland podcast, avoid controversy. <laughs> um, so we're going to do an episode called Are You a Heretic? And we're going to talk about the He Gets Us Super Bowl uh, commercials. And we're going to talk about The Chosen. Uh, just because, you know, we figured you'd like a boring episode that wouldn't really anger anybody. So we're just going to play it safe and talk about those two things and, you know, maybe get something controversial next month. Yeah. We, uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I had a joke about the chosen, but I I will save it for next week. You'll say, yeah, just in case you're unable to pick up on verbal cues, that was sarcasm that I was using (laughs) while I was describing next week's podcast. So buckle up, bring some popcorn. Uh, It's going to be a wild ride next week. So we look forward to talking to you then. Until then, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time.